Hey class, this is going to be a kind of interesting project and quite different maybe from other things you've done. It's about site-specific sculpture. Uh, a type of sculpture that could be made out of almost any material, but the designation really means it's made for a particular or specific place. I got about three or four videos that I want you to watch also in this module. Um, I'll show them to you uh, where they're located in just a minute. One of them is about this project by David Brooks called Desert Rooftops. It's in New York City, in the Bronx. You can see it in the middle of the area. These are close-ups of it. They are the type of rooftops you would get in the suburbs but brought to the city. And they're very specific to um, an area that he used to visit a lot in southern Florida. So if you go down in your modules to site-specific project, you'll see some videos here. This one is about desert rooftops. It's by David Brooks. It's a seven-minute video about um, he's talking about what happens when a suburban roof is transplanted, transplanted to an urban block. Very interesting. It's in relationship to the site that it was from and also the one it's going to and kind of making a commentary on urban sprawl amongst a lot of other things. There's another project that I'm going to talk to you about, an artist I'll talk to you about, Thomas Hirshhorn, but this is a different project that it's an eight minute video about that he did in New York City as well. It's an interactive piece where he kind of almost creates a monument that people can interact with and actually add to. Really interesting. So you want to watch that video and you're going to want to watch the other one in here about this guy named Mark Dion. And this project was about him creating a um, a mon well kind of like using a tree and I'm not going to tell you much more about it because I want you to read this interview that he talks about it and watch this short video. This is very short, just kind of, he talks a bit about, he's not worried about whether people consider what he does art, basically. So check out that interview though, that's pretty interesting too. And then lastly, there's a four minute video about a sculpture on trial. And that's the link um, that I'll show you the sculpture and the, and the rest of the presentation and you can actually watch the whole thing about where he talks about it, Richard Serra. Okay, so that's just to get you a little bit of information about this module. So David Brooks, Art Desert Rooftops. You can see it here. And I think it's really interesting because it considers the site of the public art space in, in a city but uses it to really kind of almost um, critique the way cities develop and then how things sprawl out. This is another piece by Thomas Hirshhorn called Robert Walser Sculpture. Um, it's pretty interesting and uh, really a little bit probably strange for a lot of people to consider sculpture because people are actually able to go into it and engage with it. And it's a whole area that he set up for this this purpose. Maybe even set it to be like a dystopian science fair style presentation. Where there's almost like too much information and people are supposed to be able to interact with it and do things like a, a laboratory for viewers. Um, it's a, He's a Swiss artist and this is a kind of common way in which he works. He He doesn't just want to activate public space but he wants to compel an exchange with his audience he's trying to get people to be included and almost confronted so that they give they feel obliged to join in and to be a part of it so it's a very different way of working we could call that relational aesthetics but it's also uh, an art object in and of itself too and it's almost like a literal social platform, like Facebook in, in person almost. Made out of mostly plywood, OSB, and he has a lot of writing and um, kind of weird text that he uses. He had a, inside of this there was 
a decentralized fleet of local taxis stocked with his um, books, a free book exchange, a bookstore filled with translations of Robert Walzer's novels into non-romance languages, and um, <laughs> and a whole section about um, titled "Bringing in the Arab World." It's it's a really interesting, which was a political critique, um, some of Walzer's novels. So it's a really interesting, really kind of uh, unusual project that you probably haven't seen a lot of things like this. The next guy I want to talk about is named Mark Dion. He is really into these ideas of scientific uh, inquiry, and he works a lot with museums and permanent collections of museums where he kind of almost comes in and he doesn't think of himself like he has to be an, a realistic researcher but he's able to come in and kind of mine their archive of all their different things and he will create something that's interesting because he says about it artists have no obligation to be scientific or even to tell the truth the freedom to be a speculative is to be speculative, experimental, and associative can lead to marvelous exhibitions. So he takes all these objects from the permanent collections and creates a whole installation setup where he's trying to talk about the nature of maybe that place, that museum, and the objects that could be found in it. And he's done a lot of projects like this where he goes into the rainforest and collects things and brings them back. In a way, he's almost like an anthropologist or... Um, maybe even a field worker in like some type of geology or even animals, um, plant botany. It's it's pretty interesting stuff. So this is a way of thinking about place. You, you may be wondering right now, what the heck is he talking about? Well, what is the place here? It's the museum collection, and he's creating objects out of it. All different types of objects. This whole thing is a sculpture, but he's using these objects. He's not making them, but he's using them to create one big sculpture, an installation. Same with this. And these are actually being more built traditionally, like actual roofs dropped into place. So you're going to want to think about a place you're interested in. This may be getting a little bit closer to a more traditional idea of installation. It was a reconstruction of a piece from back in the 70s where a woman crocheted inside of this space. It's called Womb Room, a crocheted environment. Um, it was actually known as both Tamely Crocheted Environment but also Womb Room. It's by Faith Wilding and it was from 1972. In a way it almost looks like a giant freeform tea cozy of ropes and webs filled with like crochet patterns. But it once was a, sh a kind of a piece that was made in a mansion back in the 70s and redone. It was a whole group of feminist artists who made it together in, down in L.A., other famous people. Um, when you go up inside of it, they say that the yarn in the cord is knotted in rough patterns of bumps and gaps, and they resemble almost a wall of cells in the body. The viewer feels enveloped in an organic space, eerily disconcerting like you're almost inside of her womb. That's how it felt watching her make it, at least, is what people said. It's definitely a kind of critique about um, women's work and how it's women's work is seen as not valuable or included in things. Back in this time with the feminist art movement, there was a lot of critique of the fact that women's work literal artworks also like this and others weren't put into museums so they're dealing with a lot of those type of issues amongst other things pretty interesting on the totally opposite spectrum is Tilted Ark by Richard Serra and this is the one that has the video of the sculpture on trial as you can see it's in a courtyard and goes all the way across it like a big steel wall. And the reason why it was on trial is because he refused to let it be torn down even though these people in these buildings around here were really pissed off because they had to walk all the way around it all the time and it blocked out their view. 
even this whole courtyard was completely not used and not really even important to people. But as soon as he put this big metal wall across it, people really got pissed off about it. And they literally, um, he had to go to trial to defend it being a site-specific sculpture that it was no longer its own self. It was ruined or destroyed when it wasn't here because it was about dealing with this space and bisecting it and making something that was making commentary about this sort of drab architectural surrounding as well at the same time. Pretty interesting piece. So watch that video. It's about four minutes long. You can stop right now and watch it if you want. It would be a good idea before we go along. There's a next, and then we'll go on to the next piece. So I'm just going to pause a minute for you to um, get off here and go watch that video and then come back. I noticed that a lot of these pieces were public art. Not all of them. I mean, by public art, art that was specifically out in the public, like this piece and this piece. These pieces are, are also public art, but they're temporary. And this piece was actually more like a gallery exhibition piece, as well as this. It was in a museum, the Bronx Museum. So public art, what exactly do we mean when we talk about public art? It's often site-specific, meaning it's created in response to a place and a community in which it resides. It often interprets the history of the place, its people, and perhaps addresses social or environmental issues. This is an example of a piece that's public art in an airport. And it's a pretty interesting piece by Laurence Argent. I like his work quite a bit. I have another piece in this slideshow as well about his work. I mean, of his work. Being, It's actually in Sacramento Airport as if a rabbit hopped out of the green space that surrounded the airport and all of a sudden into this space and then was going on a trip. Um, and it's kind of like, if you see, it's kind of got all this geometry over it and it looks almost like it's flying, right? It's leaping down inside of a place where it's going, down in its hole, like its rabbit hole, but also on a suitcase trip. But it has sort of a kind of... Uh, reference to geometry and man-made things and flight and maybe even like science like a wireframe and so I think that's interesting combination of maybe something like aeronautic design mixed in and dealing with like the way in which green spaces are taken over by place places like airports on the edges of cities it's another piece of his I really really enjoy this piece um, it's supposed to be as if a bear came rumbling, came like rumbling, tumbling down the mountain into the city in um, Denver and was looking through the window to see an exhibition because this is the exhibition hall in Denver. Um, again, kind of dealing with this idea of urban, urbanness in the midst of nature and how animals would interact with human things and maybe even in some way talks about the nature of man, people, in, re in reference to how we fit into nature and exhibition in some interesting way. I really like this piece by Richard Jackson. It's at the Orange County uh, Museum of Art, ACMA. Um, it's a fiberglass dog that he actually made. It, it peed paint onto the building. It was yellow paint and it went all over it. And he purposely did it, and the museum okayed it, so that's interesting, because it's kind of a piece of architecture that's totally bland and boring and just like all the rest of them around there, not really befitting of an art museum, they said. So they let him basically create something to piss on the art museum um, and kind of critique it. And so it's specific to this place, this architecture, but also it changed it, and it's permanently on site, so it's a very interesting piece. So this is something you can think about how something interacts or critiques with a space or what's around it creating a form or maybe the space itself, the size of it, and a piece that um, changes it in some way. Here's another piece that is public art. Maybe not quite as strongly place-related except for that 
it's closely connected to the British Library. It's right there in the plaza, and it's a sculpture of Newton, uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Um, Pelosi, it's a really large bronze sculpture, and it's on a high plinth outside the British Library in London. It's based on a drawing by William Blake. This is William Blake's famous drawing from 1795. William Blake's a pretty well-known artist. And it's a print, which is a personification of man limited by reason. It basically depicts a naked Isaac Newton sitting on the ledge beneath a mossy rock face while he's measuring with a pair of compasses or dividers. Um, the print was intended by Blake to criticize Newton's ideas and kind of how he believed he was usurping sacred knowledge and power. So, as a scientist, the sculptor admired, has like a, had an admiration for Blake's print for a long time. And so he decided that he wanted to work with something that was dealing with this idea um, because it's found in the same area, the print being the sense that Isaac Newton was British and so is William Blake and dealing with knowledge in a knowledge repository basically interesting piece this is more directly um, site related and very strongly connected to it it's actually literally the casting of the inside of a house it doesn't exist anymore because it, the house was going to be torn down this artist Rachel White Ritchie cast the whole inside of it and this is like a negative space the house was around it it was taken out and it left the space because this house was going to be torn down in sort of a style of house that was old in england um it's a she's a british artist and she did some interesting stuff this is in 1993 and it created a fierce and shocking sort of idea to them and they called it a destructive national controversy. Some people loved it and thought of it as a ghostly masterpiece that paid homage to the history of the East End of London because um, that was where this was being was from, a row of houses that were demolished at the edge of a certain area in, in East London. Um, but other people absolutely hated it um, and they just thought it was a total eyesore. I think it's really overall pretty amazing um, piece and she won a, a prize called the Turner Art Prize because of it. It was eventually was demolished and most people when they talk about it don't talk about maybe the beauty of it or the object of it as much as the politics and the protests and riots around it. Um, they, this happens a lot with statues in public. People pull them down and the rage that they have over them. But they don't necessarily always think about them as artworks. So this isn't the type of artwork that anyone's ever going to probably pull up or put down because it's not an image of a particular person that would be offensive. But in a way, it kind of is a very strong political statement to have the absence of something made solid. She has a couple more pieces like this that I'm going to show you examples of. One is called Water Tower. It's again the casting of an inside of a water tower. These type of towers, it's out of resin, are all over New York City to help water pressure. And so it's like a beautiful jewel-esque one because she made it out of resin as if the water was there kind of stuck without the, the tower around it. Um, it's in lower Manhattan, but it was eventually purchased by MoMA a few years later, and now it's on the, mo the roof of MoMA. Um, she's talked about it saying one of her first times in America, she went to the New York City and she saw all these water towers on the rooftops, and she really enjoyed them. She didn't know what they were and didn't know why they were there, but there were these weird wooden barrel-like objects that sat on top of many roofs in very awkward ways. It occurred to me that they were like part of the furniture of the city, sort of street benches, or they're just something that no one really took much notice of. It's something that I often do is try and give those places and spaces that never really 
had a place in the world so much, some sort of authority and some sort of voice. So she wanted to cast one of these to get that idea across. It's kind of ambiguous as to what it really means um, in a way, but I think in some way it kind of does talk about the way and the history of the place and the way it's changed and that they needed these type of things. She has another piece, interestingly, in public area around that area. It's called Cabin. It's, again, the idea of negative spaces and structures. It's a concrete cast of the interior of a simple cabin. Um, I guess you could say it's suggested of places like you would go on retreat or introspection. It's on a place called Discovery Hill that overlooks New York Harbor, and it creates a sort of place of contemplative quiet and distance from the city. Strewn around it, she has castings of um, bronze casts of discarded objects that were there, like bottles, cans, and other kind of trash. And some of them are from the island itself. So it's kind of an interesting piece talking about the absence of quiet and contemplativeness in a big, giant city like New York. You'll see a lot of these pieces are related to cities, I think, and a lot of it is related to urban and nature critiques and space and maybe quiet and the way people move because that's a lot of public art kind of has that as a natural sensibility. There's a lot of areas though that you could consider sites and it doesn't just have to be collections. It can be the site of a museum collection or a collection you already own in your own house, but it could be a kind of process that people do like camping or thinking and reading and collecting or a place you've been before and you notice something about that stuck with you for a really long time. There's a lot of ways to do this. I think the steps in the process you could see of as brainstorming some sites and measuring them to see what they're like, doing a mind map, which is you put the place or idea in the middle and kind of come up with a bunch of ideas that come off of it and kind of keep going through there. Do some small drawings about it, and then make even more detail, but larger, but not too big. Thumbnails are just tiny little ones, like your thumbnail is small little fingernail. And then you do some final drawings you're going to post in the uh, module for feedback. You're going to post those for feedback right there, in progress discussion. It's going to be a good idea for you guys to take advantage of this discussion so that you can get a little bit more um, interaction with me about this and what you're thinking, posting about maybe you take some pictures of some places you're thinking about and sketches and different things so that we can have a little bit of a dialogue here all together about this. And then after you get your feedback you want to get some kind of final drawing and then you're going to build it. So early on brainstorming you may want to consider answering a few questions. What's the story or history of the place, right? Like this is a history of New York City or an island or the mountains or the green space. Who uses this space? This was something that was a big time problem in this piece because Richard Serra messed with the square and most people just wanted to walk diagonally across it. So who uses it? What does it make you think or feel about? This is the type of stuff you would put inside of these, the middle of these, and then get your brainstorming. What else is nearby the area? Like the green belt nearby the airport inspired this piece here. What will the sculpture be made of? So if you remember I said it's multimedia, and if you look at your project sheet, you're going to be focused on using sculptural techniques to design and create a freestanding object or high relief work. It should belong to its location. It can go all over the place. It, it can be made out of basically any media. Um, it doesn't have to be a particular one, but it would be mixed media means at least two, which is pretty easy to do. 
because say you made it out of paper cups, well, all you have to do is add glue and tape, and you're already at two. It could be a lot of found type of media or ones that are like clay, you know, that you just use generically, but it could be some kind of found type of things. What do I mean by that? Well, objects that already exist that you adapt and change in some way, like this guy took objects from the museum and adapted it and put them together and changed the whole and created a setup and a space with them. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like you take wood and carve it, but it could be. And you're going to want to think about um, how you're going to install it in the place. So how does it connect to the wall or sit in the corner? You're going to want to think about what else is nearby, like I talked about with the green, but what will it be made of? You know, these things need to relate to each other. Who uses the space? What's nearby? it? What's it made of? What's it make you think about? This is the kind of process where you're doing research and coming up with quick little sketches. And when I say that, I mean like they can be quite quick where you're like, okay, I want to think about making something. I'm thinking about hearts. So I'm going to do something with hearts and keep it zero. And just do things like that to get your, your ideas flowing. And then as you go along, they get more refined, and then you get some final ones that you're kind of proposing an idea with them. And your more refined ones are going to be using to post. You're posting them in that discussion there that I showed you. In progress discussion. So that will be your more refined sketches. They don't have to be perfect, though. Um, you have to turn in three drawings or models. You could build them if you wanted in this discussion board. Think about the finish of the piece that's reserved and it feels finished. It can be any number of mediums. It doesn't have to be only two. I'm just saying it could be simple or it could get up to a lot of them. It could be almost any scale, but it has to be purposeful to its site, right? Because it, it belongs in its location. So the scale should really be term determined by that. You're going to have to think about how it, it's displayed or engineered or presented or mounted in the space. That's important part of that because it's made for a particular location. What's the difference between this and maybe just a normal sculpture is that a lot of sculptures designed just to be put anywhere. It's um, what we would call like an autonomous object. It can just be taken, put on a desk on the floor, and it still stays basically the same. It is what it is, wherever it's at. Well, this is more of a type of art where you're actually considering that once you take it out of the place, it doesn't exist the same way. And it, in certain ways, people would argue that it would be ruined. That's what the argument was in the sculpture on trial. Some other artists you might want to look at, Richard Serra. Robert Morris, ooh, these got joined together, Wave Hill, Walter De Maria's Earth Room, there's a place called David Ireland in the San Francisco Bay Area, he has a house he worked on for a long time, so you might want to check out some of these people, I already told you about her, and they're pretty interesting, have some interesting works if you're kind of thinking about different stuff, some of them use um, earthen materials, like Robert Smithson has something called Spiral Jetty, that's a really giant piece, um, that you might be really interested in looking at if you're interested in the idea of working with more natural materials. So have a look at that. It's due October 14th. You have to take pictures of it. So I think it's pretty clear. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out and email me and use the discussion board so that you don't feel lost. All right, guys, I believe in you. going to be interesting to see what you come up with. Take care.